Good afternoon, everyone. We are very excited to share with you this discussion regarding the Alabama Supreme Court ruling and its impact on the future of IVF and nationwide. My name is Myrna Masonette, and I'm a labor and employment partner with Greenspoon Martyr. I have the pleasure of sharing this panel with an extraordinary friend and lawyer, Marla Nufo, who is a partner specializing in surrogacy matters. Last but not least, is an exceptional lawyer and a brain trust in our law firm, Alan Cohen, who is a partner in the Wills Trust and Estate uh, Practice with Greenspoon Martyr. As you know, on February 16, 2024, the Alabama Supreme Court issued a first of its kind decision ruling that stored embryos are afforded the same legal protection as children under the state's wrongful death of a minor of 1872. Uh, to say that this decision created an earthquake is an understatement because what it certainly created uncertain uncertainty and literally halted IVF uh, treatment in Alabama and created uncertainty in the across the United States. Subsequently, the Alabama legislation uh, let the legislature pass the bill who, which protected IVF providers from civil and criminal liability for loss or damage to embryos during IVF treatment. It was signed on March 7, 2024. It does not, however, address the personhood decision of the Alabama Supreme Court. Now, the question is what happens now and why this is important. Uh, Marla and I had a discussion the minute that the Supreme Court came because I am one of those persons. Uh, my partner and I used IVF, and we have two wonderful, beautiful girls uh, that are seven, will be seven years old, but we have some embryos. And I call Marla and I'm asked, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? Can I move my embryos? Do I, can I destroy the embryos if I'm not going to use them? What are we going to do? So we are here today to see if we can at least try to give some guidance to people because this is an uh, uncertain situation. So Marla, take it away, so to speak. Yes, thank you, Marna. Thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Marla Newfeld. I'm the third party assistant reproductive attorney at Green Spoon Martyr. What brought me to this area of law is that I personally went through my own infertility journey and ultimately worked with a surrogate to have my kids. So this issue, let alone it being the practice area that I work in, really hits home due to the fact that I also you know, have frozen embryos and so do all of my clients and many of my friends. And you know, infertility is something that really impacts you know, one in six people. So this is a far reaching case and the consequences are really still being determined since this is such a new issue. So as Myrna mentioned, uh, the Alabama Supreme Court gave personhood status to a frozen embryo in a storage tank. Once this happened, clinics in Alabama just shut down, you know, within 19 days, which is pretty unheard of for any legislator, legislator to uh, organize themselves, immediately passed a law allowing the clinics to proceed, you know, performing IVF procedures. That law has kind of its own issues as it was super broad, extending to all you know, releasing all criminal and civil uh, negligence for uh, for people that handle frozen embryos to allow IVF. So now it's, you know, there's a lot of unclear language and what's going on in Alabama as far as the ability to destroy embryos, what liability to clinics and storage facilities have in protecting embryos still. And a lot, I got a lot of calls from clients going, well, what do I do now with my embryos? I mean, once you create embryos, they do stay at the clinic for a short period of time, but eventually embryos are shipped off to long storage facilities. And sometimes patients don't even know where they are, what state they're located. They might leave the state that they're created in. So as of now, there's nothing preventing somebody from moving their embryos outside of Alabama, you know, if they're concerned with their ability to use them there or destroy them there. Embryos can remain frozen for a very long time. So now people are wondering if in Alabama and in other states where this might be passed, a similar type of law, what does this mean? Do I have to use them 
or donate them to somebody else? Do I, does that mean I have to allow someone else to have a genetically or possibly genetically related child or indefinitely pay for storage fees where, you know, people going through IVF are already spending so much money on this process. They have to now indefinitely pay uh, a storage facility to continue preserving them because they would be subject to you know, criminal liability if they, if they destroy them or donate them to science. Um, there's also the concern that this personhood status law might have far reaching impacts on whether it could be used to criminalize women or providers that assist with having a miscarriage, a, a miscarriage or an abortion. Could it be extended to further penalize uh, anyone ending a pregnancy due to this personhood status of a frozen embryo? So the concerns are definitely far reaching and still being determined Although it was a good move, you know, that at least IVF can continue on in Alabama because it's devastating to be preparing for an embryo transfer cycle and everything just shut down. I, I presume there were people who were mid-cycle and, you know, just had to start over or really impacted their, their process. So that's where we're at. Uh, as far as the legal implications, like I said, there's really nothing preventing someone from moving their embryos out of Alabama. Uh, Alan's here to talk about, you know, in Florida right now, embryos are classified as property. We do not have a personhood status law yet, although there were attempts to do so, that law was withdrawn. So right now it's classified as property that can be uh, handled through a contract as far as what happens to your property if someone dies or divorces or separates. So Alan's going to talk about the consequences of what, how people address this in their estate plan if we do end up having personhood status in Florida. You know, sometimes you're right. This has been going on for a while now, and I'm old enough that I remember before this was even an issue, but it's become an issue in a number of years. But it's always been, as far as Florida is concerned, it's always been property. And uh, you can put a provision in the, in your will or your trust that says that, you know, you direct that the uh, genetic material, the frozen genetic material, uh, maybe continue for your spouse if you die. Uh, you can direct that it be destroyed, uh, maybe at the death of the surviving spouse. Um, I have seen cases where they want it to continue for children um, and, and things like that. But it's always handled under what we call the like the tangible property clause, the tangible assets, uh, not a person or a human being. Uh, you know, traditionally, if you had children, you would do a nomination of guardian. You would you would want to make a provision that if something happened to you, who would take care of your children? Who would be the guardian? Who would raise them? And you know, making frozen genetic material uh, into a person or a human brings it more in that realm. Should I do a, a guardian nomination? You know, of my genetic material, who would do it? And 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 it's it really is is quite an interesting area because. I'll give you something I was thinking about last night. I wasn't even, I know this is just, this would make a great movie, by the way, Marla. And and uh, Mar yeah, I think that the, I have a lot of clients who do what I call dynasty trusts now. They create trusts that go on for their children and their grandchildren. Um, so if something happened to you, Marla, and you were my child, I would I would do a trust for you, if maybe for your lifetime, for your support, maintenance, health reasons. And then upon your death, we'd pass on to your children. Well, how would it be if your surviving spouse decided after your death to make a lot more Marla children. Why? Because there's going to be a lot more money coming potentially. Um, you know, let's say I die and I have two children. I have five grandchildren. Well, make about six more on the Marla side and I can have, you know, 11 grandchildren instead of getting 50% of the uh, money of the trust, your family is going to get, you know, 80% of the money from the trust, depending on that. And, so there's, there's just to chime in on that, Alan, posthumous conception is another area nationally that the laws differ from state to state. Yeah. Florida actually does address this, that if the child's not addressed in the will, they will not inherit if they're conceived uh, posthumously. Right. But there, there actually is a, a provision that you can, you can put a provision in, in a document. But what, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is this making frozen genetic material into humans versus personal property is a big thing. Also, you you mentioned something a minute, Marla, that I think is very interesting. These genetic material go to fertility clinics initially, you know, and then eventually they get to long-term storage facilities 
wherever they're at. I, I don't know where they're at. Um, and but these place these things have contracts too. There's contracts with those facilities. Absolutely. So you know, if I'm if I was drafting something in a document, I would like to know that it's consistent with the contract that the people have entered into with the fertility clinic slash long term storage facility, and it and just ju just drafting it without maybe reviewing the contract could create an issue by itself because it might be in conflict with those contracts. Uh, and that could cause a, a lawsuit by itself. So these are really, really interesting areas. Uh, but clearly, uh, the case that came out in Alabama, the because I have a lot of people's documents in Florida, that and it's still fine right now, that, that direct that, that, and by the way, the lawyer, has to ask now on my checklist. It didn't used to be on my checklist years ago. You must ask if the person has frozen genetic material, frozen embryos, frozen, you know, when, when any, you know, any type of frozen genetic material, frozen eggs, frozen sperm, you must ask these questions because if they, if you don't, this could become a, a, a major problem. But I, uh, I, I definitely think that, uh, for now, I have people that I have documents right now in our in our office that direct that at the death of somebody, whether it be the the testator on the will or it could be the surviving spouse of the testator, um, that the genetic material be destroyed. Uh, and that's actually a pretty common situation because sometimes people don't want people using genetic material after they're gone and things like that. So. I'll stop there and then we can come back to some more of these these issues that are really, I think, quite fascinating. And just to supplement, as far as adding that to your checklist, I think that's a great thing you're doing for your estate planning clients. I think this also has implications in marital law as far as divorce goes, because if embryos are now going to have personhood status, this could have implications with child support, tax credits. And I think marital attorneys also, also should be finding out whether a divorcing or separating couple have uh, frozen embryos to contemplate in any kind of either prenup or divorce settlement. I mean, I, I would think that there are plenty, plenty of people out there that wouldn't want their ex-spouse uh, taking their genetic material and potentially having children with their genetic material. But on the other hand, maybe they have genetic material because one of the spouses couldn't have children. And so if that spouse got hold of the genetic material, they might want to have children with that genetic material, but the, the ex-spouse might have an issue with that. Yeah. Um, and actually the case law nationally on that is a little bit all over the place. I would say generally the law provides that the party that does not want to procreate will prevail over the one that doesn't want to procreate, that does want to procreate. Uh, although there are limited cases which have found, like you said, Alan, that if somebody can no longer make an egg or a sperm due to cancer treatment or age, whatever it may be, there are limited cases where the court did find in favor of the party who wanted to procreate over the one who did not want to procreate right. when they did separate. So that's right. also, you know, a lot of case law balancing the different um, interests with that. Marla, let me ask you a question for a lot of people don't live in Alabama and you may think, well, this doesn't affect me. But for people like me who live in Florida and candidly, when this happened, I immediately called my storage company and said, where are my embryos? Yeah. And they said, they're in Florida, but don't worry, because if something changes in Florida, we are making plans to change it. And assuming that there's no... Uh, ban of IVF or, 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 or a national recognition of personhood and embryo, what would you recommend to the people that are really have stored material at this point, what they should be doing? You know, Alan talked about the contract and I was just thinking to myself, I don't remember seeing a contract. It's been a long time. Maybe I need to go back. What are your recommendations? I mean, that's the thing. When you're going through IVF, you're handed a thousand forms. And it's just one of those other things you just sign, 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 let's get going many times. But 
in Florida, the law does provide that a party should set out what their disposition is for frozen genetic material in the event of death, divorce, or unforeseen circumstances. So most likely anyone going through IVF within at least Florida probably does have forms to that effect that Alan, Alan was referencing. And not only do they have them with the fertility clinic, they might later have to sign them again with the long-term storage facility. Can, can, can I ask a question? May not, like, this is not I, me asking the question, but I mean, so the for you have your you have your frozen genetic material in a long storage storage facility, like in Florida, like we were just told. What control do you have that they don't decide to move it to their their sister facility in Alabama, as an example? You you don't you don't know. I mean, I know for when we went through it, we had to sign additional forms when it was time to leave the clinic and send them off to a long term facility. But I can't say that's true for everyone. So you know, I, I do think what Myrna did was a prudent move as far as calling your clinic and finding out where the embryos are, and then speak to an attorney in that applicable state to find out what the laws are regarding personhood or what the potential laws in the pipeline might be to consider a game plan. I mean, I wouldn't suggest people just start moving embryos all over the country to try and dodge laws that they're, you know, in anticipation of something coming through because there is always a risk of moving your embryos. I mean, there's cases of tanks failing, and that's actually what led to this case in, well, in Alabama, this is someone dropped the, yeah, the on, yeah. they dropped the tank. It actually wasn't a medical provider. It was a patient that snuck into the, the lab and picked up the embryos with their bare hands and dropped it because it was sub below, you know, sub temperatures. Um, but yeah, find out where your embryos are. And it might not just be embryos. I mean, this also applies to frozen eggs or sperm, although embryos is what's received personhood status. But see where they are and you make an analysis. What you, what you, you know, see what your plans are. If you're using them soon, you might be more willing to want to move them sooner because you, you might be afraid that clinics might shut down like Alabama. And if it's for a long-term storage, I mean, it might not be as much of a concern. So it's a case-by-case -case analysis to decide based upon your situation where things are. And, and you may, just because not everybody understand the IVF journey, when you are going through the process of IVF, most likely the embryos will be stored at the clinic because they're going to use them and they either use them immediately or they store them, they do genetic testing and then they implant them when the time is right. But after a while, uh, they go into long term storage. Is is that correct, Marla? What yes, most times the clinics only hold them for a certain period of time before they're shipped off to a long term storage facility. And like I said, not always in the same state of the clinic. Many times they're shipped off. How long is long term? I mean, I'm not a doctor to say, but embryos can be frozen. It's a very, very long time. I mean, <laughs> and I, I'm not aware of a time period of when they, the, de the technology is so good to freeze genetic material that this could, at this point, from what I'm sure it's, it's indefinitely, you know, they could be held. And the storage fees are hundreds of dollars every year. It is not cheap. It is not cheap. I just want to encourage people if they have any questions while we are uh, talking to please let us know and we will answer those questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, the laws okay. are rapidly changing. This this personhood status case just seemed to come out of nowhere. And, and just yesterday, Florida Supreme Court now ruled that Florida now had, well, in 30 days, have a six-week abortion ban with very limited exceptions. So this is not something that you can do research on and think about it for six months. You need to make this analysis at the time of when you're thinking of making a change because the laws are changing rapidly, especially now as far as pr reproductive rights go with abortion, personhood status, it's, you know, it's a pendulum of the, the way the law is swinging and it's, it's changing rapidly. Right. Uh, Marla, are there any states that you know that have recognized personhood? I understand that Georgia uh, might not say personhood, but might have something similar. I mean, Georgia gives a lot of rights very early on in the stage of conception. So they provide tax credits to the fetus and things like that. So, again, the laws change rapidly, but, the, you know, Georgia is known to be a, a very conservative state with more rights to a, a fetus than many other states have. And Myrna, I know we were talking about this morning that there's many other states that have pending legislation similar to the Alabama case. Um, and like I said earlier, Florida quickly had some laws that were going through and then it was withdrawn because of the backlash that happened in Alabama 
I mean, generally nobody wants IVF to stop, even the most conservative politician, but um, you know, it, it needs to be a little more organized in how they're going to execute this, this plan if that's what they're going to try to do. Well, you know, and I, I understand that people don't want to stop IVF, but there's more to IVF than just producing the eggs. For example, this is a great question. So in Alabama, do you have to pay for store to store embryos forever and ever since you cannot destroy them? Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I do, have there been a ruling? That's the thing that we don't know, but I think you're allowed to move the your frozen embryos from Alabama and that's what I would do. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that I'm aware of that prevents it. Um, there's, you know, no aiding and abetting or re restrictions on your constitutional right to travel um, freely with, with your property to, or it's not property in Alabama, but to move it to Alabama to do what you need. I mean, and then you have to think about if you're not going to continue, if you keep them in Alabama, um, if you're not going to continue paying for storage, you have to consider what the laws are regarding embryo donation. Because every law has different, every state has different laws regarding the legal ability to donate your embryos. In some states, it's treated like an adoption. Florida happens to have a good statute contemplating embryo donation, where it's essentially the same as donating an egg or a sperm, but that's also a state-by-state -state analysis. But I would think that if they're going to say that they're personhood, you have the right to take your children wherever you want to. So you have the right to say, I'm taking my embryo someplace else. And yeah, do that's whatever. Right. I agree. So, I think so that, I, I, I'm, cur I'm curious this thing you just said, because it's, it's interesting to me. The because it's not in the in that necessarily in the in the state and trust area, but if a person stops paying for the the storage, at some point, I'm assuming, like any storage facility, they could what? I mean, if you didn't pay for your storage for your tangible property, they could auction it off, I suppose. I assume if they can't auction it off, they can donate it, I I assume. So that would mean anybody could have these embryos, I suppose, at some point, potentially, if you stop paying for it. I mean, I think that these are like, this is like the outfall that we're going to see what happens and see what the storage agreements say, because I mean, yeah. I would imagine they also have the equal ability to destroy it, but a storage facility in Alabama might not be able to do that since it's not an ordinary course of IVF. And it's like, because, because the logical assumption would be if I drafted a, a will or a trust that says, the people direct that at the second death of the spouses, the, the frozen genetic material would be destroyed, but now you can't destroy it. So then the family says, fine, we're just not going to pay for the storage anymore. We, we can't destroy it. I won't pay for it. Yeah. Now, what's going to happen when that happens? Okay. With, with the genetic material, you know, I, where does it go? Who gets it? Um, good, good point. You know, yeah. Well, right. that do you know of any current uh, legislation or move to make personhood uh, a national issue? I mean, I, I don't know. I When I was doing my research and I, I told you about the states, I, I didn't see that there's any claim for personhood at this time. Although I, the I mean, issue with abortion, the ban of the abortion, this goes hand to hand uh, because it, this kind of came from consequences, not consequences, but from the holding from Dobbs. And it, a lot of people uh, rightly concluded that IVF would be impacted and embryos will be impacted. So uh, obviously that, that we don't see anything, but people need to be on the lookout because there's a lot of uncertainty at this point. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have to just kind of be aware of what, what the law is at the time and what's in the pipeline and things are changing quickly. And like, it's important to stay on top of that. And I guess that includes uh, going ahead and uh, talking to your wills and estate trust uh, to address the issue. You should be doing it anyhow, because it's property. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I, even, even if the law didn't change, even if this Alabama case had never happened, Everyone that has photogenic material, it should be in, it brought it should be dealt with in your estate plan. It should be dealt with in your um your wills or your trust. If you uh if you're alive and incapacitated, it should be dealt with in your power of attorney. It should be dealt with uh and 
if it if you have it and it hasn't been addressed, maybe you ought to go in and have it relooked at and and have it addressed because I think it's important regardless of what happened in Alabama, it should happen. And Myrna, could you touch upon the employment implications since that your area of expertise? I mean, that's also evolving as far as rights go, as far as employment benefits and things like that. Yes, interestingly enough, uh, the IVF uh, can be offered as a benefit. The a lot of uh, there's some states that require it as a benefit. Most of the states don't. It's just like everything we're talking about here. We we talked about a little bit about Alabama or Florida. You have to look at the state law for the benefits. And in this case, uh, obviously, the as an employer, if you are offering, you have to see whether you have employees in Alabama and uh, what uh, immediately get together with your uh, uh, health insurance to see what steps they are taking to provide that. I know a lot of employers and talk to their healthcare provider and they were told they were given alternatives if they were in Alabama. But uh, uh, the issue here is if you offer it, you still have to pay attention to what the law says because uh, you may have to stop offering, which is uh, really a sad consequence of this. Uh, but you know, it's something that I think people are asking more because infertility, as you say, is a is, is a problem, and it's not only infer infertile people that are using IVF. By the way, same sex couples use IVF. Single women use IVF. Uh, single men use IVF as well too, or surrogacy. So that is something that you know a lot of people are more asking. But the minority of employers, uh, not the majority, but the minority of employers do provide it, and it's in certain circumstances, and they have capped, and they're looking into that because part of the IVF process and benefits provided allows for storage, not long term, just storage during the IVF process. So. And that is you need to really get in on the phone immediately with your uh, health care provider and see what the what where they're storing, what the alternatives are, uh, because that's a very important uh, component of providing benefits. So. Marla, do you. I'm just open to questions if people want to discuss it any further. I mean, it's just really my take, the takeaway is just that this is rapidly changing area of law. It's important to speak to a, a experienced reproductive attorney in the applicable state so you understand where the laws are on personhood status, abortion rights, um, you know, your IVF benefits with health insurance coverage. It's just so many things to think about and it's really a case by case analysis and a state by state analysis. But as far as the Alabama case goes, you know, it's important to find out where your embryos are. And if they're in Alabama and you're concerned, there's nothing preventing you from moving them outside of Alabama. And going on a takeaway, if you if you are going through IVF or have gone through IVF, if you have uh, stored embryos, do contact somebody uh, at the storage facility to see your contract. Uh, you know, you guys talked about that. I myself haven't done it. I guess I have to do it. Uh, look to see, make alternative plans, uh, ask them as I did, do you have, can you send it someplace else? So you know, in case of, you know, something happens and be aware of what's happening in your own state. So you can, I mean, we can't predict what's happening, but at least we can be uh, proactive in trying to have an alternative plan because this is very important for everybody. Also contact people like Alan, to kind of make sure that your will is, uh, uh, you have incorporated uh, some of those issues. And again, this is kind of like a, a law school class. It all depends, it all depends. We don't have an exact answer because things are changing quite drastically. And uh, I'm sure that we'll have more guidance as things happen, but at this point, all we can do is try to uh, mitigate certain issues because we don't have an answer at this point. Is that correct? Well said. Well said. Exactly right. There's more questions than answers here sometimes. There is. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are reaching our uh, time limitation. If, uh, if you have any more questions, please let us know. Uh, or if you don't have a question now, but you will like to uh, 
do a, a follow up questions, feel feel free to contact one of us. Uh, and uh, I hope we enjoy you enjoy this because we certainly did. Uh, and I bid you farewell and have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Marla. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. for including me. All right. Thank you for including Bye -bye. me too.